All right. Thank you so much, Matt. We do have four speakers this morning. Our first, Dan Hoffman, is a development officer within the College of Law. And I did ask Dan for a fun fact, and his fun fact was that he and his wife, Patty, met while serving in the U.S. Navy. Thank you for your service, Dan. And um, since, since getting married, they've grown a big family of both introverts and extroverts. And that's an important thing to know because today, Dan is going to be talking with us about the quiet ones. Please welcome Dan. Thank you, Ayana. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to start with a, I'm going to read you a little story. Montgomery, Alabama, December 1st, 1955. A public bus pulls to a stop and a sensibly dressed woman in her 40s gets on. She sits in the first row of the colored section and watches quietly as the bus fills with riders until the driver orders her to give her seat to a white passenger. Now the woman utters a single word. It's one word that helps America find its better self. The word is no. That comes from the introduction of a book authored by Susan Cain called Quiet. And in that, and of course the person there is Rosa Parks. And what Susan Cain did when she was, what she discovered when she was researching Rosa's life was how she was surprised how quiet and actually really shy she was. In fact, Rosa Parks' autobiography is called Quiet Strength. So it kind of indicates where I'm going to go, try to go with this talk. So my premise is, and I agree with Susan Cain on this, is that the quiet ones amongst us have a lot to offer. And it's kind of our responsibility to help them, maybe notice them a little bit and bring them out so they can insert themselves and share some of the things that are going on inside their head that we may not either notice or think somehow they need to be fixed. Uh, a lot of people who are introverts will say the same thing. They'll say, yeah, I always felt like I should be more extroverted, more gregarious. There's something wrong with me. And extroverts sometimes will say, yeah, what's wrong with you? How come you don't say anything in meetings? Why are you always in the office working by yourself on things? So I'm going to kind of challenge some maybe assumptions that some of us make in here and hopefully offer, offer some tips. So how do we notice these people? And what do we do about it? Well, the actual full title of the book is called The Power of Introverts in a World that Can't Stop Talking. And the author, Susan Cain, gives us a lot of research, and I don't have the time to go into all that right now. But one of the things that she talks about is the culture of personality. So she claims that in the United States, up until about the early 20th century, we had what was called the culture of character. So think of like an Abraham Lincoln. Um, I always think of that picture of Norman Rockwell where the man is standing up at, city, at a meeting. And he's like a farmer, and, you can tell he's kind of a, and he's standing up, and all of the big shots are looking at him because he's speaking. Um, and the culture of character was less concerned about public persona, magnetism, gregarious personality, uh, and was more concerned about how a person operated in their private life. But as the 20th century emerged, became more industrial, people didn't know each other as much, so people felt the need to kind of have to convince everybody that they could do certain things, that they were good. And the model became shifted from that to the culture of personality, which was really the model was the great salesman. And one of the leaders of that was, of course, Dale Carnegie, who wrote that famous book, right, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Now, I'm not bashing extroverts, OK? They have something to offer, too. But what Susan Cain says is we sometimes are overlooking quiet people, and we're missing that balance. And this culture of personality has emerged in the workplace to a point where maybe we're missing the opportunities that are right next to us to learn something and have someone on our team who can really, really contribute to what we're trying to accomplish. I want to share you a little story. This is a very personal story. This is my daughter, Grace, when she was a junior in high school. Very good swimmer. Very driven. Crazy imagination. She lived in her brain with all kinds of things. Loved to read. Um, very competitive. But really, really quiet. Still quiet to this day. In fact, she's, she's pursuing a PhD in history, of all things. So when she was a junior in high school, she was awkwardly shy. And she was a good swimmer, and she wanted to do well. So, one year, she qualified for junior nationals, and she was surprised by that. She was a sprinter, 1,500 yards. And when she got to the meet, she was with the Bowls School in Jacksonville, so Bowls Club Swim Club. So when she got to the meet, Bowls really wanted to win the national championship that year, and they were on point the final evening. But the coaches were calculating what they needed to do, and the key was for them was the 4 by 200 relay. They had to get at least a third place. 
So they had a couple swimmers to think about, and there was one swimmer who was very outgoing, very popular. She wasn't having a great meet. Um, she also had the credentials, and she had swum these times before pretty effectively. My daughter had never had the time needed that they needed, which was a minute and 52 in the 200 yards. Um, however, one of the assistant coaches knew her really well, and what's interesting is that coach and Grace became close because they both had a great passion for books and reading. So he had noticed her. So he made a case behind the scenes. Really, it was like a big fight with the coaching staff, convincing them she was the right person that she would deliver if you put her on that fourth spot on the relay. So he convinced the coaches, and then he went to Grace, and he coached her. And he said, OK, Grace, you get a chance to swim the 4 by 200 Of course, she was scared to death. He said, when the coach comes to you, this is what you're going to say. So this is how it went. Coach pulls Gracie aside and says, Grace, do you want to swim in the 4 by 200 relay tonight? Yes. Can you swim a 200 in a minute 52? Yes. OK, you're on the relay. So of course, she got on the relay. I was watching all this. She swam it in exactly a minute 52. And she was so tired that they had to pull her out of the pool. But my point was, hopefully this gives you a little ins insight, is this coach is almost like a model for what you can do if you have someone on your team who's noticing you, who's going to pull you out. Now, I know a lot of times people say, hey, Grace, you need to jump up. You need to get on there and get, stick, you know. But that's not her nature, so she needed a little help. And in this case, she got a lot of help, and the team benefited from her individual contribution. So a lot of people say this, two heads are better than one. Susan Kane challenges this assumption. I kind of agree with her. And one of the things she says is there's this new group think in the workplace, and I, and I try to remember her quote, but basically what she's saying is there's this new group think in the workplace that says all creativity and productivity only comes from what she calls an oddly gregarious place. So what she's saying is there's this mindset that we just have to always be in brainstorming, and there's actually a lot of research that shows that brainstorming is not actually the best approach to coming up with new ideas. Just saying. You can read the book for more details. So I want to think, uh, you ever hear of Steve Wozniak? Those of you who are maybe techies? So he's actually the gentleman. He was with Hewlett Packard at the time who built the first personal computer. Yeah, he read, he studied, he listened. He was working for a company. He had to go to meetings. But he essentially built it on his own. And what was really interesting was she spent a lot of time interviewing him and others who knew him. And the one remarkable fact was about him was that Mr. Wozniak from the time when he was about 13, was almost always by himself, especially when he was working or studying. So the point is, sometimes it's a good thing, and it's a good thing for extroverts, too, to recognize it's not a bad idea to go in your office and shut the door and work on something. Or when you have a decision to make, to say to your supervisor, how much time do I have? Or I need you to get back to me. I used to work for a gentleman who come to me and said, I need you to make this decision. What are you going to do about this? And I said, how much time do I have? And he said, what do you mean how much time do you have? I said, do you need it right now or do you need it a week from now? And he'd eventually go, all right, you got a week. Let me back. And I would always make, because he allowed me to process it. But I also found that when he would say, I need it right now, I could still process and make a pretty good decision. So I hope that, I hope that helps a little bit. I want to um, move it along a little bit to a quote that I really love. Something similar to what my dad used to always tell me. This is Lao Tzu, so I want to read it because I like it so much. Those who know do not always speak, and those who speak do not always know. So I'm just going to illustrate this with a simple, fun story. It's a true story. Excuse me. So I was out golfing. I'm a Navy veteran. I was out golfing with a bunch of people. We were all former vets. It was a foursome. And one, guy, one, of, one of the gentlemen was a very good friend of mine I worked very closely with, and I knew how competent and proficient he was. Very quiet, very reserved. And uh, someone started talking about the movie Black Hawk Down. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that movie in Somalia, the crash of the Black Hawk helicopter and the nightmare that ensued. Anyway, one guy started going on about how he knew how the movie didn't know this, didn't know that. He knew everything that happened at Black Hawk to the point where everybody was getting tired of listening to him, quite frankly. So after a few holes, my quiet friend finally spoke up and he said, you know, I don't really think that's how everything went down that day in Somalia, Mogadishu. To which my other friend said, well, how would you know? Were you there? So you, deadly question, folks. And my friend looked at him and said, yeah, actually I was. I was a special operations Black Hawk helicopter pilot, and I was on the scene trying to coordinate the rescue. I was like, 
ouch. I remember saying to my friend, see that little cup in the middle of the green? You could probably fit in there right now. <laughs> the point of it is, I'm challenging everybody here, and some of you are already doing it, probably better than me, is to notice people. Because you tend to look at people and look at how they're behaving, how they conduct themselves, and then determine what they can offer. And you might be surprised, the person who sits in the back of the meeting, the person who's, like I said, likes to work on their own, or the person who likes to spend a lot of time on their own, might be that person that can offer you something that'll give you a really good idea or insight. So if I could, if I have time, I'd like to do a quick survey. So real quick, who here, and it's not bad to admit, who here thinks of themselves as an extrovert? Loud and proud, please. All right, thank you. Now avert your eyes, extroverts, because I'm going to ask the introverts, who here considers themselves to be introverted? All right, you don't need to be fixed, OK? You don't need to be fixed. One thing that could help us all, though, oh, I have to share this with you. My natural disposition is quietness and introversion. One thing I learned from that is I had a father who was the ultimate extrovert, all right? So I know he was a little befuddled by me, but he did two things that were really cool. He encouraged me to pursue the things that he had no understanding of why I'd want to do them. But then he said, but you also have an obligation to insert yourself at times, getting up in front of a room and sharing your thoughts and ideas, saying something to your supervisor about an idea you might have to have. So he pushed me into situations, all kinds of situations, that he said, no, you got to learn to do this. You have to share what's going on in your head. All that time spent together reading and playing and thinking about these things. And um, one thing he always said to me was, don't look at a person's style. Look at the lesson they're trying to teach you. Now I'm going to say one more story. And I'm going to go a little over time, but I really want to tell the story. And then I'll wrap it up. So my first year here, I went to see a gentleman out in the panhandle <clears throat> who was a graduate of UF Law. I was going out trying to meet all these people. I sat down with him. So awkward. Met him in a Panera's. He's reading a novel, drinking a cup of coffee. I don't even know why he made the appointment with me. Took me 20 minutes, 15 minutes to get him to say something you know, about himself. I was so uncomfortable. And I finally was able to get some things out of him. I felt pretty good about myself. A Couple weeks later, I saw in the news, there was a story about Ted Bundy. I don't know if everyone remembers Ted Bundy, the most, probably the most notorious mass murderer in the state of Florida. And I saw this man being interviewed. So I turned the radio, TV up. He was actually the man who prosecuted and convicted Bundy. I had no idea. So one, I didn't do my homework, folks. But two, I misinterpreted his awkward style as being someone who I should feel sorry for, who wasn't competent. So I sent him an email sheepishly, and I said, I had no idea. Why didn't you say something? He said, it was never about me, and it was never about Ted Bundy. It was about me making sure that I saw the case through properly. So I leave you with that thought in this final quote. And just remember, there's quiet people all around you. Don't, dis don't discourage them. Don't ignore them. I would reach out to them because you might be really surprised by the ideas they might have to share with you. And I would argue, this is saying a lot, they might help you with a problem on your team, but I wouldn't be surprised if you hear something that's going to surprise you about them. It might even change your world. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time.